I want to just sort of keep <laughs> running. Other people might want to do that too. <laughs> Welcome to the visiting writers track meet. <laughs> I actually just started reading a book that is about um, soccer or football, where these writers are writing back and forth. And it said in the author's note for one of them that he was on the Swedish national author's soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to, do all countries have like nationals, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. The United States national painter's foosball team. <laughs> currently in second string, but showing a lot of comments. <laughs> Welcome to the Visiting Writers series uh, for the final reading of the semester, or perhaps indeed ever. One never know. <laughs> Thank you, etc. I have written down my notes. <laughs> uh, Thank you to um, the college and the fine arts and humanities division and the English department and mostly to all of you, uh, my colleagues, uh, some of whom are called students and some of whom are called professors. Tonight we have the privilege, I hope you saw the moon. I hope you had that privilege on the way here. Tonight we have the additional privilege of welcoming poet and prose writer Bethany Cantor and poet, musician, and alchemist Brian Cherry. More about them in a moment. After the reading, or perhaps you have already done so, please stay for a cookie, and I think hot chocolate is the other thing on offer out there. Um, <clears throat> and during that interval, after the readings, there'll be a brief period where you can do things like um, buy this beautiful book called Ruins, Ruminations, and Rituals by Brian Cherry, uh, which is here, and you can see either Brian or us um, about that, or say hello to the poets, or uh, et cetera. And then at 7.15 or so, um, my class and anyone else who would like to is invited to stay. They have prearranged for us a, a lunar sort of Semi, semi sphere uh, for us to sit in, and with, there'll be pizza and conversation. Finally, if that is not enough poetry for you, there's an open mic and poetry slam led by Anthony Febo, all the way from Boston. I've seen this on posters in Woe's place at 8:30. So we're going to end in time. That if you want to. Take the poem that you write during this reading and then go read it at the open mic. You can do that, and that would be a good thing to do. Um, so we'll go on and on into the night. Okay. Uh, our first reader tonight is Brian Cherry. Brian Cherry, as I said, is a poet, musician, and alchemist. Uh, poet, uh, musician, I'm happy to have this new. See, I, I think there's only one of these here tonight. No, there's there's more, so also you can also ask about uh, the CD of music, um, wonderfully with slightly different spelling of Brian, because the Brian with an O is okay for poetry because poets can handle that slight variation, but for in the music world it was a little easier with the A, so there's a Brian Cherry with an A, same person, if you're wondering. His poetry is new to me. And I'm excited to hear more of him in person. I've already had a great conversation uh, before the reading. I received this uh, book last week, Ruins, Ruminations, and Rituals, on the cover of which Brian seems to be playing a saxophone, and the bell of the horn seems to include all of Milwaukee, or maybe all of all cities uh, that form, forms the horn. At least that's the way I, I seem to understand it. But he also seems to be playing the guitar. And now I see that's probably a microphone that he's singing into. <laughs> So just endless things to see, even just in the cover of the book. In a trip to Target 6317, he writes, I want to view every piece of film that was taken of me for security footage. 
and he answers with his own surveillance of the system that would surveil him. It's a poetry of music and reversals, in other words, alchemy. Brian Cherry has been published in Return to the Place of the Gathering Waters, published by Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, and he's also the author of the chapbook Funeral Journey from the Quail Press and the full-length book that I showed you, which is available here tonight, which is a bit uh, from Anarcho Welfare Press. Uh, and both of those were published this year in 2019. He lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm thrilled to have Brian Cherry here tonight. Please welcome him. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Brian Cherry and I do stuff. This is one of the things that I do. <laughs> uh, this is a poem about, let me check the time so that I can get us to the pizza. <clears throat> this is a poem about where I grew up. I grew up on 16th and Atkinson in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, it's the inner city. Uh, a lot of turmoil, a lot of beauty though. Uh, this is about that. It's called Dust Phrases, Pagan Dome Styles. The man on the corner trying on new faces like schemes and artifice. The whole damn city is his hand grenade. The myth catches an errant lilt out of his gunshot mouth. The sky is kind of like a reunion. The lightning, a kind of rambling slaveholder. And what of the holster and its emptiness and the corner man blankly his stare into it? I be loving how slow motion this overarching funeral is. These words tumbled as an aside from a boy already nine and a half years into his funeral journey. God sings a drifter song, hoping to make everyone more at ease. Under the boardwalk, down by the sea. Yeah. The God song only sprinkled down morosely and was heard as rights, the last ones, the rights that cause riotous actions like those rights in symphonic spring, spring when the bunnies, now strong rabbits, do the majority of their fucking. Man on the corner, pint of gin in black plastic bag, look at him lapping up the rainbows. Lord, let this motherless passage make this vessel safe until it can burst bloom like weeds in the vacant lot where 50 years ago a house once set where a few iterations of families once suckled at their sentient constitution. When I was a war zone. When I was a war zone, picked bullets out with dainty hands out of gap-filled teeth. Watched as smoke exhaled my lungs as my linguistics struggled to choke out a proper way to crave death. Took delicate bones from frenzied birds as they reacted to me as they would to weather's wild phrases, like the ones we have outside right now. <laughs> Lapped up poison with crimson tongue, wept in a manufactured fashion, allowed my chest cavity to be propaganda. The fighter jets, their wreckage intercourse, dropping seeds to bloom slaughter. At ease, in my bloat legs, kinetically, generals exhorted this to children. Inner turmoil, a flank exposed in my eyes. Enemy is within, without surrender. The savaged mental health, feed, we must feed, I must feed. Contortions upon full-on spirit abortions. Razors, sticky, abundant losers. Filling up my innards with the spoils are the winners. Black gold mine veins split my lizard brain. This is about war too. <clears throat> it's called War Games. It helps not to be so human. It humans not to help being so helpless. As ground grumbles under shanking steps, 
as the moon waxes under uncertain wings, these machines less than care, these metaphors of opening earth. In the distance, salutations are given to less than an acquaintance. Intangible blurry images image us as an aberration from non-being. These are just places, monsters who act maudlin in memory. The bedroom floor, its bent nature, its slippery acts of violent valor. Look at the gist of the gyrations as they topple delicately placed cairns. The earth is a tomb and a womb. We are of the earth. What are we? So these poems come from everywhere. Um, this one in particular is about my son, Miles. Um, I always like to preface this by saying he's the best thing in the world. If you'd like to fight about it, I'll be out front in the, at the end of this. But let's not fight, let's just be friends. This is called Pear and Bluish Ceramic Bowl. This pear, it sits in bowl. Kitchen bending itself to keep it. In a number of days that is already written, it will be lovingly cut and skinned in the seven pieces. A son, soon to be two, will eat the honeyed flesh of four of the section pieces. And in between, in permanent handfuls of macaroni and cheese, with a mouth engorged with sustenance, he will point to the ceiling fan. What's that, Daddy? <laughs> it is my first time here, too, son. I drift, drift, trying to find my mind. When was that pear attached to tree? What composition did the soil harbor? What machine or human harvested it? What truck jostled it across mannerisms of fissured land? Matter cannot be created nor destroyed. Who tells these stories? Can they be asked if this son's matter had ever lain with this pear's matter? while woven into the emptiness prior to the story of the Big Bang? Time is just gravity, or is it the other way around? Almost two years old, almost infinity, almost a boy, almost a pair. coming out on a cold night tonight. I should say that because, you know, I don't like the cold. I'm from here and I still don't like it. There are people at the beach right now in San Diego, so that's <laughs> happening. <coughs> this is called The Will of Instinct. Uh, the title is taken from a Kurt Cobain song. Um, it amazes me the will of instinct is what he says. <clears throat> Mary eating Magdalene the contrived commerce of innate impulses. Food, shelter, sex, food, shelter, sex. Robbing Peter to satisfy Paul. Mother, mitochondria, marketing the cell. Moans ministering about the inherent nothingness. And for a moment, they mitigate an ancient power struggle. Reverse cowgirl, an inverse link to the world. The time stopping coming of a truth laid bare. Barren words devoid. Resources exchanged, satiate a soul with an illusion, satiate an illusion with a soul, an aspiration for control over one's being, the means by any necessary. The ragged roots of why this conflict is needed are Byzantine, taut, and gnarled. Magdalene eating Mary, Peter and Paul in each other's arms, dead. Food, shelter, sex, food, shelter, sex, Food, shelter, sex. Uh, so, I hear you guys are doing like, some of you are doing like daily writing things. Uh, this is something that I kind of like to do on the thing called YouTube. <laughs> you can find all kinds of videos of your favorite poets reading their work and you can be astonished, and I like to write about my experience doing that. So in that vein, 
And it's called Watching Frank O'Hare Reading Having a Coke with You. <clears throat> Cigarette is held as if transformed into a right hand afterthought. Where is the ash that that cigarette created? This was 1966. It is now 52 years after he listed places that I still have no idea about. That ash has to be somewhere, probably not as ash, but as what and where. 52 years ago was one year after Congress agreed that packs of cigarettes would carry a warning. Caution, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. This mosaic man whose eyes grazed the camera exactly four times in the one minute and 45 seconds, who mentioned seven severed locales which rise through the fragmentation, occasionally moves the cigarette to rhythm on the emphasis words. Was he concerned about what this eternal cigarette and all the other smoky silhouettes inducing cylinders, colloquially squares, might do to him? So many cigarette pictures of this man so much zagging language, like Chinese lanterns of flame in the sky, filled with numerous luminous cold constellations. The sky, his gentle tongue. In a few short numbered days from this poem's recitation, Fire Island waits to cull him. I just hope he was not concerned about the potential for cigarette death. It helps me to believe that those ashes endings are now somehow a part of a red-winged blackbird stumbling about in dew damp Kentucky bluegrass in nascent Midwest spring. That at least some of his body's molecules have become grime, that is, mucking up the painting of a young man on his horse at the Frick Collection in New York City. We doing all right out there? This is called Denouement. Outside grocery store, I flip reciprocal receipt in the metal trash receptacle and flash in the past eating the present. That one inch by three inch document showing my debts have been exercised for fried chicken and black cherry soda, and it is a coda as it parts my hand. The paper it was printed on its origins of plants with a woody stem, which could have grown to heights where limbs could have articulated at angles to and from the earth. That being, while it was alive, wasted oxygen, which was taken in by other organisms who went through their own life cycles. It was once a germ fed into ground and fed by ground. It occurs across my synapses that there would also be no receipt without Johannes Gutenberg and all of his ancestors, and all of their joys and struggles. When the great arbitrator begins its shift on my life, it may encant. Do not you feel when you were singularity and you first tasted yourself as the receipt? <clears throat> ah, this is about kids getting killed in their schools. <clears throat> It's called thinking of getting that chicken sandwich. I cannot tell why the flag is at half mass at this Chick-fil-A in this suburban environment. Is it a soon to be distant slaughtering of teens or a smattering of small indignities that simmer like a rainbow does in the summer's haze? No wind here, no time here. Flag is a delta river drooped and gingerly basking in its shadows. Should we stop to reflect on whatever weight bears itself upon the depression of old glory? We do not. We pass and get mocha coffee, burst ourselves through space, illusion ourselves as the remains lay balloons, teddy bears for the risen some 1,440 miles away. Tears do not come for the dead as they attach themselves to us. As we take our caffeination in the target, we dismiss the bullseye. Transgression so tender, we've been driving all night. We've been blowing off steam. We 
are part of the catastrophe. We are atrophy. Defibrillators up, down, the chest, 17 years, 34 years, 14 years, wiped clean. Clean is not for the about 230 million trudging through a winter of haphazard implication. How long should we not be able to tell about mast, about what half means, and each night's impetus wrap the flag up and down according to human created flag rules. Variant in purple waves of waving, wavering grain floated upon seas to shining seas. Take a moment to take in the holy nature of what will someday gleam as an impotent manifest destiny. So I got this new project. That was all from Funeral Journey, my chat book. Um, got this new project, uh, which is called Making Love and End Times. And it's appropriate. This one starts out with another gun violence poem. <coughs> That's happening. It's probably happening right now somewhere, unfortunately. It's called Gunshot Dayton, Ohio. <clears throat> gunshot, 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 gunshot. And about 35 more gunshots. 32 seconds. You brush your teeth as the world burns for much, much longer than that. These folks are now dead to this world, to their families and loves, dead to this world. And answers seem to waft illusory. It is us clinging to gods in fear, and us not truly hearing what Barack Obama was elucidating. Wrap yourself in the flag, for we self emulating tonight, just like every other night, as we try and find love and destroy each other. Uh, this is about going to the zoo with my kids. I got two kids now. Miles being one, Tessa being the other. This is about taking them to the zoo. It's called eligibil eligibility verification. <laughs> it seemed like all the people procreating these days end up at the zoo on Saturday morning, as soon as the zoo opens at 9 in the AM. It seems like a good percentage of them have the people that procreated them in tow. <laughs> all of this is holy. All of this is sex. All of this is mundane. The penguins jump in, out, in, out of concurring water. This is a 51 degree grayscale spring day where the polar bear looks dirty and full of scrawn sleeping on a rock. How many deft winners of the struggle to make it to the next generation are armed with fruit snacks? Snacks that do not truly taste of fruit, facade alluding to the wildness and mirth. It all reeks of a gentleness that one can barely feel. Fitness finessing patterns out these humans. Humans finessing patterns out this fitness. Uh, let's do, this is a poem called Sex. Man, it fun to assimilate, assemble from child's play, curse at the gods, make them from human minds again, birth the egress digression, Curates ancient bone marrow in the modern malaise and nights consumed with manic prayer. So there it is in full relief. Contents plastic and shown through with inescapable light caused by those keeping it hid. To open up the overlays that strike out, that sink in as the floating debris again washes ashore. The night fills their silence, their productivity the emblem of the next to be entombed, entertained by the oldest folk dance. So we had a good conversation earlier today about just writing in the moment and trying to just be a witness to things that are happening. And this is something that this is literally actually, like a lot of these actually happen. Um, it's 
called holy. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Three times blessed by a God I do not necessarily believe in, by a man gray in the beard, heavy in his weight, and seemingly his heart as he asked me for change. And I contemplate change, both the non-existent change on my person and my personal volta, motifs of capitalism and tendencies of polar existence appear and dissipate, flashbangs disorienting my questioning. Need to turn left off North Avenue to entrance of freeway heading south to escape this man who has moved on to other opportunities to bless, to receive communion, to escape this self. Self, sometimes so lost that the real is little but vapor over a mountain being blessed, being cursed by a beggar's God. A God who is treating said mountain like the fierce sounds of a wild, cornered animal. It's called Puppet Track Behavior. I think I just got a couple more left, so thank you guys for listening. Plaintive moans, ghost stories from quieter nights. They know each other as human beings. The waves and cryptic paintings. A caption captured in the dead house. Stilly meanderings in corn liquor. Cindering branches in bizarre carnivals. Mundane the circumstances, the circumcisions. Rendering tombs for pregnant tongues, a barrage of other days. Cool nights on the visage fitted vistas, where the wind is totality. Hills dug in ground into missing earth. Burns on with a what the fuck. What the fuck is going on here? Like a pop album drenched in cum. Like yesterday, love become rock. The chairs are geometric. Loss of gains, gains of loss. Dead animals resting all heartbeats. I will read two more. It's called Winter Will Be Black, and it's apparently turned into a little bit of a prophecy. <clears throat> the cars are backed up end upon end up on the broken city streets. This is where there is more than dead violet, pink, and hazel flowers. Outlandish are the ways in which this simulation escalates. This city eats from its womb. The cars grumble and mumble. Their humans silently cry out in the strong polar wind. This place contorts with the glow of constant survival. This city blanks them all beneath a sheath of humbleness. Look at how cold we are. Look at how cold we all are. Look how hurriedly others move feet with muscles forged in legs which get direction from electricity in and out brains. Sun, it hangs high over this gently waking mid-sized metropolis. But at its current angle to the city, the hydrogen eating machine might as well be black. This is sheer cliff weather, with the occupants of coat chants flowing in Sumerian, grinding toward the circle of sleep. Uh, this is from another new project I'm working on. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm from, small town on the Great Lake, just like this place. Um, there are a lot of uncontrolled intersections where there's no stop signs or stop lights and you just have to make your best decision. <laughs> and I started thinking about that and kind of spun into a whole idea for a book. Um, this actually came from a, directly out of a dream that I had about two weeks ago. Um, woke up in the middle of the night at 3.30 and just got into my phone and started writing it. So this is called Uncontrolled Intersections number four. I'm at the fake granite countertop table in my burst orange kitchen with a bird 
probably 43 ounces of bird, bird which has never known flight or been able to run, and I rip flesh out with my bare hands. Paring knife is sharp and reachable, yet I rip its rotisserie garlic and other herb infused left brush flesh out with bare hands, even taking a bite without plating first. <coughs> Animal meat comes to light and umbrates, obliterates, well healed me. Put on your business casual clothes before work me. Use words that are too big for me, like umbrates me. Walk cleanly by pedal me. And I allow the clear juices of the flesh, which has been cooked evenly to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, so it is safe, to run down my not shaven for two days stubble face. What arousal I amass from this private ritual, with wife of 11 years busy rearing our two young children in one of our two equally as small as my killing filled kitchen bedrooms. As she thinks that I am carefully, gently, caress cutting this Costco procured bird that I am raving for, ravishing in real time. After my splurge of anti-reticent behavior, I pick up paring knife and pare the bird down the four portions, still lush with mandible, pushing bird flesh upward to maxilla, Bird flesh now grinding in incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. The lust contained, but still unmoored. Thank you, guys. Bethany Cantor, who I have known for eight or years, nine years, something, quite a few years, amazingly. Almost as long as I've been here at Carthage. Um, she's from Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. She received her BA in English from here and her Master of Fine Arts from Columbia College in Chicago. In 2015, Bethany worked with the Friends of Lorene Niedeker documenting marginalia from Lorene's personal library and also worked on the Ed Smith's uh, archival... Tim Dugos. Tim Dugos. Oh, I thought it was the other one. No. Okay, Tim Dugos. So an archival expert as well as many other things. Uh, Bethany's work has appeared in Salt Front, Columbia Poetry Review, Alliteration, and others. Uh, she's also teaching... Uh, as some of you know, creative writing here this semester as well as Heritage. I'm sure some of her students are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Bethany. <laughs> Bethany Cantor's writing describes and re-describes the present moment of the body and its fluid relationship to health and sickness, gender and sex and the everyday environment. In Sex, Bugs, and Bodies, she writes, and the whole thing is built on simile anyways, the whole a communicative structure which strives to put one thing next to another and urges the viewer to call them one. But one thing is blood, bird, and the other is pus, and the scalpel is for revelation, and the lidocaine train is for the ignorance and the act of removal itself. Which for me describes the writing, I think. That's why I like that sentence so much. And it's a kind of alchemy too, connecting to the first reading. And it's the alchemy of redescription, of writing something again and again. And I was looking at a book earlier today by Adam Phillips, a book called Kissing, Tickling, and Being Bored. <laughs> Great title. Uh, and he says about psychoanalysis, something that seemed to be true about Bethany's writing, uh, except that she occupies both the part of the analyzed and the analyzed. And the Lisanne, the, I don't know how to say that. Um, anyway, he wrote, the art of psychoanalysis for both participants is to produce interesting redescriptions, redescriptions that the patient is free, can bear to be interested in. 
And as someone who has known Bethany and others of her who know her too who feel the same way, uh, I am certainly interested in what she has to say, and I know you will be too. Please welcome Bethany Cantor. into the pavement, it comes out gray or blue, or whatever else finds its place in the snow beneath a heel. Women feel heart attacks differently from men. The guitar is oscillating, and his words wait behind an insistent knock that comes every ten minutes. Too much eye, he will say. A cigarette on the bridge of your nose, a reminder of the way they cut our limbs off, made us feel like torsos and brains. Ask him about the future. Tell him of the pasts and its lingering states. A man rides a horse on his chest, but skin should be blank without history. This is the corruptibility of words, an intensive desire to stay detached. But he pulls her brain down the bridge of her nose and bites his fingers with her teeth, and I can't get my language free of them and his teeth. Her face shoves itself into his forearms, becoming the thing it hates. He carries fire in his pocket, and his voice is a stone. Three months culminated in local anesthetic. Things do not become poetry. Um, so as I was writing that chapbook, actually, um, I felt very, very ill. Um, and basically, I just had strep on steroids, but I was like really poorly uh, treated, and I think my doctor thought I was lying to him, <laughs> um, and so he just like saw me all the time. So um, I had like three months where I didn't really eat because I was in so much pain. Um, so not all parts fit together uh, touches on that, and then sex, bugs, and bodies um, is talking about that. I was on antibiotics for three months. Um, and one of the weird side effects, if you're on them that long, is that uh, it will often develop uh, any many sorts of like psychological disorders. So I just I, like developed an anxiety disorder out of it, which is a really unexpected um, response. But that's the background. <laughs> um, content, anxiety, sex, uh, stuff like that, <laughs> illness. <laughs> Uh, 82815. Anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, is characterized by excessive worry o about a variety of topics. This anxiety occurs every day over of a period of at least six months. The worries tend to be difficult to control and to diminish the person's quality of life. Signs and symptoms of GAD include restlessness, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, irritability, impatience, 
being easily distracted, muscle tension, trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, excessive sweating or hot flashes, shortness of breath, diarrhea, headache, stomach ache, having trouble swallowing, feeling lightheaded, and having to go to the bathroom frequently. Generalized anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorders. Generalized generalized anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorders. Generalized anxiety disorders. Generalized anxiety disorder. Depression. Generalized anxiety disorder. Stress. Generalized anxiety disorder. Example. I am so scared of where and how my body has been. And yet, there is a sense of frustration in knowing, feeling, she will never get to the point of being able to say, write, anything at all. She still hasn't gotten to the very thing she wants to write. She doesn't know if she should want to say it at all, and so hasn't. The problem is that everything feels so present. All of this talk of the body, this piling on of subject matter, of subjectivity, this indulgence into trauma for the sake of trauma, all of this talk, and she wasn't saying anything besides stating what a body was. The problem is that while everything felt so decayed, there wasn't anything more to be concerned with. Even though she knows that this statement was not true then, and certainly not now, in retrospect, when she is trying to cast a veil of clarity over everything. And even this turn of phrase, meant to play on words and subvert linguistic expectations, is missing the mark and instead is serving as an additional method of avoiding the issue altogether. It's not that she is indecisive, she is simply incapable. In fact, she's wondering if she ever even knew how to write at all. Maybe it's just that she has never hated it enough to stop doing it or start doing it, but is that even the right question? She doesn't write, and that's the difference between she and I. She writes entirely too much, I barely write at all. For instance, I would never write about the feel of the needle in my hand. How when she put it in, I clenched so hard that my hand shook, and she thought that perhaps she would stab into the bone of my middle metacarpal. I wouldn't have realized how much tension my body was carrying before what was delivered eased it. But she would have noted it, and written it all by now. She would have written the way the needle leaked the cool liquid, and the way it was perceived as blood. She would have written about the way she searched his bed sheets fruitlessly for blood the first time, and the way she hid the action so he wouldn't know. She would have written about urinating on a test a year later, thinking maybe the last time was the last time, because he disappeared before paying to get rid of the problem. She would have written about these things in more detail, with more honesty, instead of hiding from words like sex, and especially fucking, and pregnancy tests, and abortion. The test came back negative, but she should have never have seen him again because he liked to say he loved someone else, even if he never meant it. She never means anything, though, so that seems the worst crime. She never let, meant to let him slip into her, but God slipped out of her, and something had to take his place. She wouldn't write about God, though. I would write about God. I would write about Esther, who danced so alluringly for the king that she saved her people. I would write about Bathsheba, who was allowed to live, but her first son was made wicked and wild by God and broke his neck when his hair became tangled in the branches of a tree. I would write about Gomer, who wanted so desperately to get out of the poverty imposed by her husband that she ran away again and again to prostitute herself. Her husband committed to her for the metaphor of her body, for the shame he could teach her about, for the good charity he gave her in kidnapping her home again again and again. Or Eve, who just wanted to taste what it is to know a godly body, who is punished with birthing the world. I wouldn't write about pregnancy, but I might write about the blood that came the day after the test, how it was the second time that I thanked God for a uterus that strips itself to say it was empty. I would write about being unclean for a week, or more commonly, for 10 days, that no man should touch me and be made unclean by me. I would write about the swirl that came when the needle finally injected the anesthetic. All I really wanted to say was that there was a time in my life when I was really quite sick, 
and I was so sick that I had to consider each time I needed to swallow, and each clearing of saliva was an excruciating labor. And there was even a time when I stopped trying to pass the liquid down to my stomach and instead spat into a Tupperware square round that was stained yellow from curry that would have been too painful to swallow. And now the fireworks have boomed far, farther off. And now that they have everything, all of this is a distinct removal, mastering the art of letting the fact of the thing dissolve into seeing or non-seeing. The seeing becoming rebellion the seeing becoming dismissal, the seeing becoming a matter of ignorance. One thing is bird and the other is pus. One thing resolves, dissolves into childhood and the other is simply this empty body. The body cannot be without filling. The body would not disrupt itself, would not yield sensation, if not for the fact that something must be preserved, observed, and more importantly, something must observe. Her presence in her eyes and not her throat is tantamount to bodily inhabitation. And I think she must feel something, as though there is something inherently useful about its usage, something inherited about talking as though there were a mouth to produce sounds that another body might sense. One thing is a bird and the other is putts. As she sits in the park, she wonders what it would be like to be without damage. The boys in Cubs tees are throwing baseballs back and forth, and he was telling her over the weekend that boys are no longer allowed to be boys. As she watches the boys group up around her, their coach, all she sees is boy, boy genuinely assured of his own athleticism as a measure of worth, of course enjoyable, its intangibility inferred by paychecks and revenue, his own shirt a testament to profitability. But she didn't mean to describe them. She meant to describe the woman across the way, reaching into her shirt and pulling a treat out of her bra while her dog rolls eagerly in the grass. She can't help but consider the effect the treat has on the sense of her breast. She recalls the mix of cat food with ammoniated roofing shingles which covered the floor of the milk tank room. If it had rained recently, she would pull the shingles back to see the mass of white maggots that would go away when the floor dried out. The cat food was kept in the pasteurization room and the kittens too, if their mother would have it. She only turned on the pasteurization tank once or twice just to hear what it would sound like despite the fact that everyone said it would cause the whole barn to catch fire. It was empty and dry and hadn't had any milk in it for a number of years. In fact, she wasn't even sure if it pasteurized the milk or if it simply refrigerated it and held it until it could be shipped to the distributor. There was manure in the trough still and the cows had been gone so long, but there wasn't much point in removing it now that it had entirely lost its scent. This woman doesn't know anything about lighting, except perhaps how to make his silhouette. And worse, she thinks that the bodies swaying on the train are her fault. Her fault the way each jostling causes every form to bend at the knee, thrust and unthrust. The man with the black tattoo of a key, the man whose tattoo was unclear, he said, because of the way his skin tone gobbled it up, or something along those lines. She finds the train miraculous and terrifying. Miraculous in its ability to convey her from one place to another, similar to legs. She hates the way they fill up a seat, never enjoyed the splay of thigh fat against a surface, her legs which have never gapped or even really split except on the insides, the parts perpetually rubbing together, stretch marks in the slightly purple divots, constantly stretching or shrinking, the bulge of fat inflated skin squeezing, sneaking out from to height denim shorts. She can admire the way her ass is contained, but her legs aren't. They've never been. Always pushed against the thread of the fabric, the zero gap rubbing over and over with every slide of one leg past the other. She doesn't like the way her hands would look pushing into the fat of her skin, but she didn't know how to talk about it without understanding something between the two of them. Her body was inside of hers, they know things together. How does she separate her body from the others and what's more, talk as though she never inhabited another body besides her own. And today they spoke about the same things they always talked about and she thought about kissing him and tearing off his clothes again 
about the way his hands felt around her neck the last time they talked, and she thought about, or rather wondered about, where her deficits lie. Because after this many occurrences, no amount of self-love and self-acceptance rhetoric could save her from feeling as though patterns reflected on her and not the various iterations of imposing parties. After all, so many people seem to have a solid understanding of imposing parties. After all, so many people seem to have a solid understanding of how these things worked, and she continually felt like she was floundering. Her body was an ever-present void that she kept trying to fill with something substantial, and her only solution was to throw it around like it mattered, to absolve whatever guilt accumulated later. Because it didn't feel too heavy for her at present, or at least she perceived it that way. And what did it matter if her perception had failed her? After all, she had been writing about her body's dislocations from the very start, from the moment it first formed letters, in fact. In fact, she suspected that the curve of the subway tunnel would not exist if it were not for the necessity of architectural integrity, integrity shape of the train set aside apart. She remembered that there were only two support beams for the treehouse she shared with her grandchildren. The bug with the pincers would stream from the spaces between its floorboards because it was cool and shady there and relatively undisturbed. If it was just her, they wouldn't mind her talking to herself, rolling plants into maple leaves to pretend to eat. And it was only occasionally when she bumped her head on the support beam that their bodies poured out to become rivulets and poured down over her or when too many children climbed up and stretched, she would wish she could remember the names of the insects. And it was odd to her that she could not, as they were the standards of that house at night, scrambling for cover in the bathroom drains when the room was lit up. They crunched horrifically when she crushed them. And so she largely ignored them. And every now and then, the whole of her sexual persona felt so false, and in this regard, unsatisfying, and she wanted very much to feel like an addition or something that could feel at the very least nearly fitting. She wanted to be clear that this sensation was not akin to guilt, but rather a disjointedness, more to do with the disconnect between her body and her mind, a constant reiteration of how separate they felt. After all, she knew that one belonged to the other, but she just wasn't sure where to fit and it worried her, and she felt relatively certain that this was an abnormality within her, whatever within meant. She knows that the question, where am I, is perennial, but this constant reiteration frustrated her more than the actual issue. And had she not lived long enough? And the people at the bus stop were talking about the big fight, and she couldn't overhear who had won, and she wondered at the destruction of any body, much less her own. But it didn't matter whether or not she understood it. A brief revelation in writing taught her not to fret the futility of cyclical questioning living. She thought maybe she shouldn't write on public transit anymore, just to freshen the subject matter. She thought that perhaps maybe she, not, she should not limit her avenues of creation and to worry about the product later, even if it all felt too clinical and analytical and lacking in description. But in any case, one thing leads to another, and she was doing something. That's from Sex, Bugs, and Bodies, which is a catchy title. Mm -hmm. um, that's a long piece. Um, I've got that winter dehydration already. Um, so I was trying to figure out what to read for this and I was going through some files on my computer um, and I found this piece that I have literally no memory of writing. Um, but I think it's interesting. Um, I describe a painting in it. Um, the painting is of Chief Blackhawk. Um, I'm from a town called Fort Atkinson, um, which uh, is the site of some really super minor skirmishes in the Black Hawk War. Um, and the town has like this big mythos about it. So it's like all about Atkinson and Atkinson is clearly the winner there. Um, 
and the high school mascot is black the Blackhawks, um, which uh, has so many commentaries to it. But anyways, the um, the painting in it is this painting of Black Hawk that's very famous um, that was made after he was captured, um, and they did this whole thing where they toured him around um, and gave him that noble savage persona. Um, but that's a small moment. So this is, this is a, a fairy tale. It's called The Oracle. And this will be my last piece. One legend is about a young man living alone in a tumble-down shack in the woods. Despite his strong spine, bulging muscles, and crisp jawline, he found it difficult to find food in the forest. The game that once were so prolific that they devoured his garden seemed to have been hunted to extinction. And the garden, a small plot of land beside his ramshackle cottage, was now too overshadowed by the undevoured forest growth, and it withered from the lack of sun. Alas, thought the man, the very forest refuses to let me live. And so his stomach rumbled and his unproteined muscles withered. In his home, he has the same painting. I try to imagine the man in the painting living, trying to picture the deer skins, the war paint, the feathers in his braid or ponytail. Maybe I saw him fighting, an image of a tomahawk, flint chiseled and sharpened. A spear? A horse? I did not picture him with a gun, although he used them. Shirtless, gray, brown, burnished, heavily hued, illustrative paint, strong prominent nose. I just saw pieces of his skin. Maybe his hands on a patch of hair, the tomahawk slicing through skin, hair breaking free. That's what the man in the shack expects. Life had its way with me, said the man I envisioned in the forest, making a dinner of potatoes and human hair, and I made poems. I did not picture him with a gun, but perhaps he had a gun too. Perhaps he shot and shot and every animal in the forest was consumed, and now he's consuming poem after poem, and none of them are real or not real yet. One man lost a war, another found a fairy. Another felt, neither felt particularly contained. A chief, a savage, a fairy tale. Bodies lost in an overhunted forest, eating and eating until the forest cannot sustain itself and grow savagely into vine and foliage and muddy brushless floor. floor. The forest will never be happy with your body, will spit you out ashamed that it ever took you in. The wizened old woman is you, especially when you've grown to hate every line that grows within your skin. Grown to hate what splits legs, breaks bodies in two. We'll wear your arms and legs out with running, the forest and I. He and you can neither be filled nor contained. A figure appears out of the rambling forest. A mystic, an oracle, all of us breathing deep someone's heady fumes, ready to lose our language in the mess that is foresight. Maybe if we breathed a little deeper, a little earlier, we would have seen the way the forest was eating itself up, and me most of all, a plate filled with meat. So fast to eat what was in front of me that I forgot that there was meat too, behind me, to my left, to my right. Potatoes in the sandy dirt. Corn growing in rows to supplant those who planted it. Every fragment of light that peeks through the overgrowth is worth hanging on to. If you sleep enough, there will be another dream to follow the one you just had. I dreamt I was trying to fit my newly grown hand into my dead one, my fingers sliding ar along the bone of my old palm. Thank you. Thanks a lot.